The average car price in the USA is over $40,000. And by the time you get it home to show your friends and family, it's worth about 35. But what if you could buy a car, drive it around, and have your net worth go up instead of down for as long as you own it? Well, today we're looking at some future classic JDM cars that could make you rich, or at least richer than you are right now. I'm Guff, this is Albon, let's get started. Let's start with a car that you might already know as a future collectible, the Honda S2000. The S2000 was introduced in 1999 as a successor to the Honda S Roadsters of the 1960s. The goal was simple, create a top-down rear-wheel drive sports car that was as light and as rigid as possible, with driver involvement being the number one priority. It was powered by a 237 horsepower 2.0-liter 4-cylinder engine that revved to 8800 RPM and was connected to a 6-speed manual transmission and only a six-speed manual transmission. And as I'm sure you guys are aware, everyone loved it. It was driving purity, made by the creators of some of the best lightweight NA cars of all time. In this day and age, cars are neither lightweight nor naturally aspirated. Hell, they're barely hanging on to even having engines. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that the S2000 has more than doubled in value over the last 10 years. In the early 2010s, you could pick up a used AP1 S2000 for about about ten to twelve thousand dollars. Now prices are in the range of twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars for used cars with a decent amount of miles, and up to forty thousand dollars for cleaner examples. The much rarer S2000 Club Racer or CR, well, that's a different story entirely. The CR was a ultra track-focused, lightened and stripped-out version of the S2000 that made its way to the United States. It was a more hardcore sibling of the Type S that was in Japan. A few years ago, you could pick up a CR for between. $25,000 to $30,000, which was reasonably close to its MSRP. Now though, CRs range between forty dollars and $70,000 depending on mileage and condition. And earlier this year, a 2009 CR with 985 miles sold for $112,000 US dollars. Needless to say, the model to have is the CR, but with only 699 of them made, good luck finding one. But if you can get your hands on a clean, low mileage S2000, AP1 or AP2, there's a good chance that you'll have a car that continues to appreciate year over year, especially as that pure driving formula becomes less and less common in the car market. The next car on the list is one that many people consider the underdog of the Japanese sports car era in the 90s, the Mitsubishi 3000 GT VR4. Now, hear me out. A lot of people don't like this car, and they might have some good reasons for it, but it's still an icon of the days when Supras and Skylines were on the front of car magazines everywhere. The 3000 GT just happened to be on page 19. First hitting the scene in 1990 as the Mitsubishi GTO in Japan, and then later as the Dodge Delft and Mitsubishi 3000 GT in the USA, this GT sports car from Mitsubishi was a four-wheel drive, four-wheel steering with a four-foot wing beast of a sports car that was designed to take on the 300ZX twin turbo and the super turbo of the time. But this was a fundamentally different platform from its competitors, being front-wheel drive based using a transversely mounted V6. In its top trim, the VR4, or the RT Turbo if you got the Dodge stealth model, the V6 was twin turbocharged, making 300 horsepower and 308 pound-feet of torque and sending it to all four wheels. And that all-wheel drive system was the 3000 GT's party trick, with plenty of magazines praising it for its violent acceleration off the line with a 0-60 to 60 of 4.9 seconds. You can buy a Mini Cooper John Cooper Works today that'll do 0-60 to 60 in 4.8 seconds, but nevertheless, 4.9 was pretty dang fast for the time. The reason the 3000 GT was maybe a little less loved than its counterparts was probably its 3,800 pound curb weight, which really lent it to be a lot less dynamic than the RX-7 or the Supra or even the 300ZX. And as time went on, the classic Mitsubitsu reliability probably didn't help. Although truthfully, the 3000 GT wasn't very unreliable, it was just hard to work on, considering that they crammed an entire twin turbo V6 and transaxle sideways in a fairly compact engine bay. Regardless though, 3000 GTs were not considered very valuable. 10 years ago, you could pick up a clean VR4 or RT Turbo Stealth for about eight to twelve thousand dollars, depending on mileage and condition. Now, low mileage cars sell between sixteen and even forty thousand dollars for the very clean low mileage Concourse spec models, with the average clean car in the low twenty thousand dollar range. And while it may not have the glamorous six digit sales of the Supra Skyline and NSX, the three thousand GT is definitely trending up in value. And with only sixteen thousand VR4s made and under ten thousand RT Turbo 
turbos made, they're certainly special enough to be considered a genuine classic car one day. The third car on the list is a proper supercar. Mid-engined, lightweight, rear-wheel drive, and faster down the quarter mile than a Mark IV Supra Turbo. Nope, I'm not talking about a Ferrari 355. I'm talking about the Toyota MR2 Turbo, specifically the second generation SW20 MR2 Turbo, which was introduced in 1989 as a more civilized and grown-up version of the original Toyota midship runabout. This baby supercar had the basic front-wheel drive inline four, but mounted in the middle of the car, powering the rear wheels. The base model was either a 3S or 5S naturally aspirated engine making about 130 horsepower. But the full fat MR2 Turbo had a 3S GTE making 200 horsepower, all in a chassis that weighed well under 3,000 pounds. By the way, I wasn't kidding about the quarter mile times. The 1993 MR2 GTS Turbo, which made about 250 horsepower, rocketed down the quarter mile in 13.1 seconds, which made it just faster than the Supra Turbo at the time. And at a retail price of $25,000, it was half the money of the Supra too. In the used market about a decade ago, you could find pretty clean MR2 turbos for about $10,000 with pristine models going for between 12 and 15,000. Fast forward to now and the market has crept up with higher mileage cars now occupying that $15,000 range and clean cars going for 20, 30, sometimes even 40,000 US dollars. There were 33,000 SW20 MR2s made total with the turbos being just a fraction of that. Hardtop turbos were the rarest of the bunch with some reports saying that as few as 10 were made for the 1995 model year. So if you happen to stumble across one, buy it. And if you're not gonna buy it, send it to me because I'll buy it. Fourth on the list is another Mitsubishi. It's crazy to think that a company like Mitsubishi, which very recently went bankrupt and then was bought by Nissan, who is now kind of going bankrupt, used to make some of the best sports cars on the market in the 80s and 90s. You might think I'm talking about the Lancer Evolution, but no, I'm talking about something even more rare than that. The Mitsubishi Galant VR4. This Mitsubishi was easily one of the coolest sleepers of the 1990s. Produced in only 91 and 92 for the US market, the Gallant VR4 was your dad's Gallant, but with an entire Lancer Evolution drivetrain. Yeah, I'm talking about the 240 horsepower 4G63 turbo and the rally bred all wheel drive system. And this had real pedigree because the Gallant VR4 was a homologation special for Group A rally, where the Gallant rally car took six victories before Mitsubishi decided to switch over to the Lancer platform. In its short two year lifespan, 3,009 Gallant VR4s were made for the United States market with only 5,000 being made worldwide total. This makes it one of the rarest cars on this list and in my opinion, the most undervalued. Every single car has a serialized plaque denoting which number of production it is. And here's the kicker. 10 years ago, you could get a Gallant VR4 in okay condition for four or $5,000. Nowadays, they go for like six to $8,000. The nicest of examples sell for between 10 and $12,000, but no more than that, really. So sure, the Galant VR4 hasn't appreciated a ton in dollar value over the last few years, but I still say it has the most potential. A limited run car with real rally roots made by a company that may or may not be in business in the next few years. I mean, that's the recipe for a classic automobile. The only problem I'd say is that most Galant VR4s have about 200,000 miles. Either that or they've been beat within an inch of their life and are on their third engine and second transmission. But if you find a clean, low serial number car and you've got a place to put it, then the Gallant VR4 might be something very special in the not so distant future. Last, but certainly not least, is the most JDM car of the bunch. It's a Nissan sports car powered by the venerable SR20 DET. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The Nissan Pulsar GTIR. Yeah, you thought I was gonna say Sylvia, right? Mm -mm. The Pulsar GTIR is way rarer and way cooler. The early 90s N14 generation of the Pulsar was like all Pulsars that came before it. A boring economy car designed to take grannies in the UK to the shops and back. But this was the 90s in Japan, so Nissan couldn't help themselves from souping up even the most boring of grocery getters. And thus, the Pulsar GTIR was born. Like the Gallant VR4, the GTIR was a homologation special for Group A Rally. At its most basic, it was just a Pulsar hatchback, but with a 227 horsepower SR20 DET connected to an Atessa all-wheel drive system. Yes, Atessa, just like the Skyline GTR, 
but this one was tuned for rally. And to make sure your neighbors knew that it wasn't just a regular Pulsar, Nissan gave the GTIR a huge spoiler and a hood scoop that was basically the size of the entire hood. This rally inspired look combined with the impressive all wheel drive system earned the GTIR the name Baby Skyline. This is, in my opinion, one of the coolest Nissans ever made. And in usual fashion with cool things in Japan, we didn't get it in the United States. They made just about 14,000 Pulsar GTIRs for the Japanese market and 771 Nissan Sunny GTIRs for the UK market, which makes it the rarest of the group. But this is Nissan after all, and Nissan loves their special editions. So Nismo got their hands on the Pulsar and made a special 21 car run of the Nismo GTIR with rally suspension, LSDs, chassis tuning and a full roll cage. This was the only hotted up Pulsar that Nissan ever made and it represents such an interesting time in Japanese car history where every manufacturer was so devoted to racing that they would take even the most pedestrian cars and give them the full race car treatment. Now, with these cars only recently being exported to the USA, I'm gonna go with UK prices to represent what the used car market looked like. And a few years ago, you could get a Pulsar in decent shape for about five to 6,000 pounds or seven to 8,000 US dollars. UK spec Sunny GTIRs were about $10,000 if they were in really good condition. But now with US import restrictions lifted for all model years of the GTIR, cars that are landed in the United States are between 12 and $15,000 depending on mileage. With the occasional $20,000 sale for a exceptionally low mileage car. Now, a lot of you guys know I don't really like Nissans, but I really want one of these. This and a Celica GT4 because they represent one of the coolest periods in Japanese car history ever. And a Pulsar GTIR right now is reasonably affordable. And while I don't see these things hugely appreciating in value right now, unless you have a Nismo, a limited production rally rocket like this probably isn't going down in value anytime soon. So then, are you still gonna spend $40,000 buying a crossover? Over, or are you going to be a JDM hero and buy one of or maybe all of these amazing machines? Let me know in the comments below and let me know if there are any cars that I missed. And of course, a word of warning, this isn't financial advice and there's no guarantee that the world economy doesn't take a dump tomorrow and your shiny new S2000 is worth pennies on the dollar. So do some real research before buying anything. And don't forget to check out our NSX video below to learn how those cars became worth half a million dollars. I'll see you guys next time.